thoughts, feelings, sensations, emotions, memories that are personal and intimate to you. The kind of private inner experience that everybody has, but nobody else can see. Nobody else can see into your own experience. A kind of mental pageant, a kind of uh, internal performance that is utterly compelling and utterly private. It's a story about who can adjudicate on that experience, particularly if your experience is veered towards the unusual, the atypical, or even the pathological. It's a story about who owns experience. Is it society and its prejudices? If you have mental health issues, is it the doctors who are trying to make you better? Are they doing that by trying to change your experience or even make your experiences go away? It's a story about how we do the science of mind, brain and body, but it's also about the politics of experience. It's about who's got the right to say to you what your experiences mean. Imagine you're at the office one day, having a conversation with a couple of colleagues. The conversation comes to an end, the colleagues drift away, but you still hear their voices. They're vivid to you, they're present to you, they're talking to you. They're talking to you about your wife and the affairs that she is supposedly having behind your back. You leave the office, you go home, and you confront your wife, and an argument ensues. You end up in a police cell. You can still hear these voices. They're vivid, they're present, they're there, as if they're there in the room with you. The experience is so compelling, the experience is so odd and strange that you catch yourself looking upwards, looking up as if you were trying to see into the workings of your own brain, looking up to see where these voices are coming from and saying out loud, you're having a laugh. This is a story told to me by somebody called Richard who was encouraged to write down his story as part of uh, a narrative of his recovery from psychosis. Voices in the head, the ultimate sign of madness, uh, in this case associated for Richard with a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. Thankfully, that's a diagnosis that no longer holds. Richard is well. He's, he has no contact with psychiatric services now. And now, because we're doing the future of medicine, let's go back 600 years, almost exactly, to the, into the past. A woman named Marjorie Kemp leaves her home in Kings Lynn in Norwich to visit the nearby city of, uh, um, in Norfolk, to visit the nearby city of Norwich and there to, to talk to an anchoress, Dame Julian, Julian of Norwich. She leaves her home because she too is hearing a voice. It's a voice that is sometimes loud and clear as if there was another person there with her. At other times it's much more indistinct, it can sometimes not even be a verbal voice, sometimes it's not a human voice or even an auditory experience. It's the voice of God. For Marjorie it's the voice of God, or at least she thinks it is. And the reason she's going to see Julian is that Julian has expertise in these matters. Julian can help her to decide. She finds Julian living in a cell attached to the church of St. Julian in Norwich. The cell has two windows, one through which Julian can interact with visitors like Marjorie, the other which looks into the body of the church where Julian can see the altar and uh, the tabernacle containing the sacrament. Julian has also had revelations of the Holy Spirit and she spent much of her life trying to make sense of these experiences, thinking about them, meditating on them, writing about them. These two literary giants, in the case of Marjorie, the author of the first autobiography in the English language, in the case of Julian, the author of the first book in English known to have been written by a woman. These two literary uh, geniuses spend a few days in Norwich talking about Marjorie's experiences. Marjorie leaves Julian's cell in the confidence that the voice she's hearing is the true voice of God, even though it is such an unusual, varied, um, highly, highly varied, highly disparate experience. And in fact, she spends much of the next few years chasing around Europe and the Holy Land, trying at great personal risk to persuade princes and archbishops that she is hearing the voice of God. Now let's go back to the present tense. I'm sitting in my study and I'm reading Marjorie's book. I'm not reading this. This is the one single extant text of Marjorie's 
uh, Book of Marjorie Kemp, held in the British Library and made it in around 1440. But I'm reading a modern version of Marjorie's book, and I too am hearing voices. I'm hearing Marjorie's voice as I read her text. I'm hearing Julian's voice. I'm hearing the voice of the other characters in the book. The same thing happens when I read a novel. I hear the voices of the characters. The same thing happens when I write fiction. I hear the voices of the characters that I'm trying to bring into, into, into life. And in fact, for much of my waking life, I'm producing and I'm hearing this ongoing dialogue, this ongoing conversation with myself. And in a dialogue that only I can hear, um, but that seems to found the entirety of my experience. I remember that there's something I have to do and I issue myself an urgent instruction. I chide myself in words for failing to concentrate. I think myself through uh, a problem to the extent that sometimes I'm even talking to myself out loud as I'm trying to solve a particular problem. So what's going on? We, there seems to be two kinds of phenomena going on here. One is the experience of hearing voices or in medical parlance, auditory verbal hallucinations. And the other is the, auditory, the, the ordinary phenomenon of inner speech. One is seen as the archetypal symbol of madness. When we hear about it in the press, we tend to get um, confronted by images like this. This is, this is what we, is technically known as a head clutcher, okay, and the press is, is full of them. Whenever people, whenever people talk about hearing voices, we get a head clutcher. Hearing voices is associated with severe mental illness. Around about 70% of people with schizophrenia will hear voices. It's also associated, associated with a whole range of other psychiatric disorders, everything from post-traumatic stress disorder to eating disorders. A whole range of different disorders involve hearing voices. But critically, it's also part of ordinary life for a significant minority of ordinary people. Somewhere between 5 and 15% of people probably hear voices, and these people are not mentally ill. The other thing, inner speech, is something that really does happen to, all, to, to most of us. Some people don't seem to have any inner speech, but the vast majority of us, I think, probably do experience this thing. So one theory holds that these two things are basically the same thing, and it's a nice, simple theory, uh, which seems to have quite a lot of good scientific support. So the idea is that when you hear voices, what's happening is that you are producing some inner speech. You're making some inner speech in your head, in your brain. Um, but for some reason, you don't realise that you yourself have produced the inner speech. So it's like your brain chucks out a bit of inner speech, but fails to recognise it as something that you yourself did. And therefore, it gets taken as, it gets perceived, it gets felt to be an external alien voice. And we have some idea of how this works in the brain. We know that there's a part of the brain kind of here in the left inferior frontal gyrus, or what's known as Broca's area, that is heavily involved in producing speech of all kinds. And then there's another part of the brain, a bit further back, which we roughly call Wernicke's area, and it's, it's again in the left hemisphere, but a bit further back in the brain. And that's involved in speech perception. And the idea is that what happens in the ordinary case is that Broca's area generates a bit of inner speech, and it does what it needs to do to make, to make the speech happen. But at the same time, it sends a little signal to Wernicke's area saying, don't listen to this, this is you speaking. You know, you can switch off, don't worry about what you're about to hear. So it's like you're sending a little tip off internally that you're, you're, you yourself are about to produce some inner speech. And the idea goes that when people hear voices, something goes wrong with the transmission of that signal. The signal doesn't get through for, for whatever reason. As I said, there's some quite good support for this theory, uh, uh, both, both psychological and neuroscientific, but as we'll see, there are some serious problems with it. And this is, in fact, where I come in. <coughs> I started out as a developmental psychologist. I studied children and babies, uh, and I was particularly interested in how language gets involved, how children start to use language to think themselves through problems. And my work in this area was inspired by the great Russian psychologist Lev Vygotsky, who's pictured here with his daughter, uh, Gita. Vygotsky's ideas are really beautifully simple, in a way. He argues that where this inner speech that we all experience comes from is from social conversations. So we start off from the earliest days of life, we're having conversations with people, we're having dialogues with people, with our parents, with caregivers, with other children and so on. Over a period of time, that dialogue becomes partially internalised so that a child solving a problem, for example, instead of having a conversation with her mother about the jigsaw or whatever it is they're doing, 
starts to take on this dialogue for herself. She's talking herself through this problem. She's asking herself questions, and she's answering them, them herself. And then, then further on in development, all of that stuff that's said out loud becomes completely internalised. It's all going on upstairs. It becomes completely covert in a speech. It's, as I say, it's a nice uh, theory. It's pretty tricky to study in a speech for all sorts of fairly obvious reasons. But what you can do, if you're a developmental psychologist at least, is you can study private speech. You can watch children talking to themselves through problems. And I spent many hours as a PhD student doing exactly that, poring over videotapes of children talking to themselves as they solved uh, problems. And what you, do, what, you've, what you see when you study children's private speech in this way is you see some of the evidence of the kind of social origins of, of of private speech that Vygotsky proposed. So I'm coming to this as a developmental psychologist and I'm saying, you know, I've been studying inner speech and private speech all these years and these people over here in psychiatry are talking about inner speech as being the raw material of hearing voices. So what's going on? Are we talking about the same thing? Let's, let's, let's go and find out. And this is really where I came in to this topic. So the answer, is it the same thing, is kind of yes and no. The people in psychiatry had a very impoverished view of inner speech. They hadn't thought about where inner speech comes from. They haven't thought about what inner speech is doing, how it's helping children to solve problems, how it has all these interesting roles in, in regulating our behaviour and helping us to think, basically. Uh, the tasks that people had used in psychiatry were very limited, and people hadn't paid attention to the social origins of the phenomenon. So we were keen to change that. Nobody had ever actually asked what inner speech was like before, before we started to do this. So we devised a questionnaire. Here it's instantiated in a smartphone app and we got people to, uh, they, we sent them a, an alert on their phone and they had to fill in a little questionnaire about what kind of inner speech they were doing at the time the thing went off. And we found evidence that people do report quite a lot of dialogic inner speech. This is a real thing that happens for people. As we've seen, we know a bit about what goes on in the brain when people do, do inner speech, but nobody had asked, well, what, what, is there anything special about dialogic inner speech? Any, anything special about this conversation that we have with ourselves when we're doing inner speech? So we did design the first neuroimaging experiment where we predicted that people would be using that left hemisphere, Broca's area, bit of the brain that produces inner speech, but they're also having to somehow represent the perspective of the other person in the dialogue. So the idea is that when you're producing a dialogue, you're talking to other people, you're, talk, you're representing another point of view. And we found that in this study, we found this interesting interaction between the left hemisphere in a speech system and part of the brain in the right hemisphere that's known to be involved in theory of mind and what psychologists call social cognition. So inner speech, a highly varied phenomenon, uh, hearing voices is also a highly varied phenomenon. If we go back to Marjorie, sometimes her voice, this is the voice of Jesus talking to her and saying as clearly as if he was there in the room with her, daughter, why have you forsaken me and I never forsook you? But at other times, the voice of God sounds like a pair of bellows blowing in her ear, the sound of a dove. And Marjorie's experiences are also accompanied by other experiences and sensations, such as visual uh, experiences. Christ actually appears to her clad in a ma mantle of purple silk sitting at her bedside. One way of making sense of this extraordinary variety, both of inner speech and of voice hearing, is to think of it of, uh, both as a form of communication. And I think if we think about the social nature of inner speech and voices, we start to have a much better picture of, of what's going on. And we're coming to a view of, of hearing voices as, as something that is much more than just an auditory experience. It's something that's accompanied by all sorts of other sensations. For example, a common uh, thing that's described by polar explorers is the sense of a presence being with you, a, a sense of a benevolent entity following you and saving you from peril. And some voice hearers that I've spoken to have said, it's not like having a voice inside me, it's like having a person living within me. It's like being inhabited by another person. And as we start to understand hearing voices from the, as, a, as a communicative process, as something that results from a particular kind of communication, just like inner speech does, we, we get a much better sense of how it is that our inner speech can represent all these different social agents, but also how these, in, these, these social agents can cro crop up, can pop up in hearing voices and talk back to us. So I just want to leave you with the idea. I can't leave you with my book because that's not out till the 21st of April. Um, 
that these two kinds of experience, inner speech and voice hearing, are incredibly complicated. They're much, much more complicated than they were when I started doing research in this area. They, 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 they're showing themselves to be much more complicated and they're related to each other in complicated ways. I hope some of you will recognize this, this sense of, of inner voices that can guide us, that can chastise us, that can surprise us or even make us laugh. And some of you may have experienced or know people who've experienced the more uh, extreme, troubling, distressing, but sometimes benevolent and positive experience of hearing voices. Many voice hearers, particularly through the International Hearing Voices Movement, have come to very different understandings of their experience. They've challenged the way hearing voices has been typically understood by psychiatry, and they've reclaimed them as meaningful aspects of their experience. So whether you hear voices or not, I think I've I hope to have persuaded you that we all stand to gain from thinking a bit more carefully, thinking in a more nuanced way about these sometimes happy, sometimes fretful, but always flexible and creative murmurings in our heads. Thank you.